Democracy in America is failing. No matter who you ask, from Bernie bros to Trump supporters and everyone in between, there is a distinct sense in America that the Republican democracy set in place by the Constitution is not working. Many people will offer many different reasons for why this is, from the Electoral College to mass immigration to simply just blaming the quote-unquote other side. However, none of these reasons are actually why American democracy is failing. The problems in America run far, far deeper than any one policy issue. I've thought about this for a very long time, and I've narrowed down the issues facing the American system to three-ish root causes. Having said that, with no further ado, let's begin. November 2014. This month, congressional elections will be held as they are every two years. If you're an American, there is a nearly 2 in 3 chance that you will not vote this year. 2014 saw the lowest voter turnout in American electoral history since 1942. This trend of political apathy in the United States has continued to grow for decades. When did this begin, and why? In 1991, the Soviet Union, just shy of 70 years after its inception, was officially dissolved. For almost half a century, America engaged in a global struggle for hegemony against the Soviets. The presence of a great enemy gave politics a concrete purpose, and when the Soviet Union collapsed, we suddenly found ourselves as the sole superpower in the world. Without the political framework of the Cold War, politics became aimless. We didn't know how to adapt to our new circumstances, and we began to find many things in our system which simply didn't fit in a post-Cold War world. Along with this, and perhaps partially because of it, so too began a period of sterile corporatization for America. In case you've forgotten, here's how things work. I order the food, you cook the food, then the customer gets the food. We do that for 40 years, and then we die. For most, there was no escape from the 9 to 5 routine of sitting in a cubicle doing menial work for which you have no passion day in and day out. It is this soul-crushing routine and the aforementioned aimlessness which I believe were the main contributors to the rise of American political apathy. Now, if that's just my theory, feel free to offer alternative ones in the comments, but regardless of the cause, it is now a reality which we must deal with. By design, democracy only survives when its people are vigilant in defending it from enemies, both external and especially internal. And when half the country doesn't vote, and half of those that do only vote on the principle of the lesser of two evils, it opens the door for all sorts of corruption, both literal and figurative. In my view, the government is much like a sentient being, an entity in and of itself, and much like any living thing, its primary motivation is to prolong and further its own existence. In a democratic society, the government is a mandate of the people, and therefore in this analogy can only exist on constant life support. It is meant to serve the people, not the other way around. However, this widespread political apathy has allowed the successful entrenchment and expansion of the government to the point where it exists practically independent of the people. With apathy comes nihilism. The sense of not being able to change anything fuels corruption and the cycle perpetuates itself. But we cannot afford to be apathetic any longer. If there's anything that history shows us, it's that the will of a people is inexorable, but that means very little if the people refuse to exercise their will. Let not anyone pacify his conscience by the delusion that he can do no harm if he takes no part and forms no opinion. Bad men need nothing more to compass their ends than that good men should look on and do nothing. No matter which way you slice it, the majority of wealth that's created in America today goes to the top 1% of society. The overwhelming preponderance of evidence suggests that, yes, the middle class is rapidly evaporating. In 1971, they made up 62% of earners. By 2015, that number fell to just 50%, and it has since become a minority of earners. In response, some will say that, yes, the rich get richer, but the poor also get richer. This is true, but the rich get richer faster, and this matters because it creates populism. <music> the 
The term populism can be dated back to the Populares political faction in the Roman Republic. In 133 BC, Tiberius Gracchus was elected Tribunus Plebis, or Tribune of the Plebeians. He was elected on promises of land reform. Now, what you have to understand is that in ancient Rome, wealth was inexorably tied to land and land ownership. The economy back then was primarily agricultural. The Roman army functioned as an army of citizen soldiers, that is, every soldier had to pay for his own equipment and was not a soldier by profession. This however created a problem with Rome's rapid expansion after the fall of Carthage. Rome's many soldiers had farms to tend to, and when they had to be away for years, they obviously could not tend to those farms. Meanwhile, the wealthy bought up the immense quantities of slaves that flooded in from Rome's conquests, and to be able to put them to use, they required even more land. With their fields going fallow, Roman soldiers went bankrupt while on campaign, and the rich bought up their lands. Even those soldiers who still had farms to come back to couldn't compete with the vast slave farms, and so ended up having to sell them to Rome's wealthy. As well, the land that Rome conquered was labeled Ager Publicus, or public land, and it was meant to be rented out to the people. However, the rich quickly started renting it all out for themselves, and in response, the Roman Senate passed a law stating that no one can own more than 500 acres of the public land. For a brief time, this worked until wealthy Romans started getting around this by inventing false names and renting out land under those. Eventually, this loophole became so blatant that the law ceased to be enforced at all. And this is where we return to Tiberius Gracchus. After being elected Tribune of the Plebes, he proposed to bring back the old law. He wrote that, The wild beasts that roam over Italy have every one of them a cave or lair to lurk in, but the men who fight and die for Italy enjoy the common air and light indeed, but nothing else. Houseless and homeless, they wander about with their wives and children. And it is with lying lips that their imperators exhort the soldiers in their battles to defend sepulchres and shrines from the enemy, for not a man of them has a hereditary altar. Not one of these many Romans an ancestral tomb, but they fight and die to support others in wealth and luxury, and though they are styled masters of the world, they have not a single clod of earth that is their own. While running for an unprecedented second term as Tribune, a fight escalated and a group of senators savagely beat Tiberius to death, tossing his body into the Tiber River for which he was named. In less than a century, Julius Caesar would be named dictator for life. What happened here? Before Tiberius's murder, there was no political violence in Rome, but less than half a century later, there were full-on armies marching on the city of Rome. Well, it all comes back to what caused Tiberius's rise to power. Wealth inequality. Arkin, let's be honest here, you just wanted an excuse to talk about Rome, didn't you? Yes, and I'm not done yet. The many Roman farmers ended up in Roman cities looking for work, but many didn't find work, or worked odd jobs, many of which did not fill their days. And that gave them time. Time to be angry. To be angry at a system that they saw as broken and working against them. That very anger is what brought Tiberius to power, and it is that same anger which shortly afterwards boiled over into a century of civil wars. Now look at America. Staggering wealth inequality, by some measures even worse than Rome's, and correspondingly the rise of populist politicians who rail against elites and promise to re-enfranchise the working class. Political violence is slowly but surely becoming normalized on both sides of the aisle, and that's not even to mention the George Floyd riots because I covered those already. Democracies, by their nature, are held up by the existence of a strong middle class who agitate for political rights and representation. Without a stable middle class, a stable democracy is impossible. The many disenfranchised become angry at a system which they perceive, perhaps rightly, as being rigged against them. They vote in populist politicians who don't end up actually solving the problem, but rather causing more strife, more division, and perhaps even worsening the problem. I am not an economist. I don't know how to solve this and I won't pretend that I do. There is something I can say for certain, though. This is how democracies fall. Everything I've discussed thus far constitutes many of the major problems facing Republican democracy in America, but ultimately, how has all of this come to be? As I briefly touched on in part one, the backbone of any democracy is the scrutiny of the powers that be by the people. Due to the inherent weakness of a system where power is divided so much, the people must be vigilant in upholding democratic traditions, respecting the institutions of democracy, and putting to shame those who try to uproot or exploit the system. With the passing of time, though, this vigilance naturally erodes. 
the fervor that instituted a democratic system in the first place fades away and comes to be replaced by complacency. That is, the belief that the present order has always been in place and will always be in place. Things that utterly contradict the founding vision of the country become more acceptable, and forces that seek to undermine democracy, whether directly or indirectly, become more mainstream. Eventually, and in America's case eventually refers to right now, democracy becomes so corrupted, so broken, that eventually revolution breaks out, sweeping away the blessings of liberty, and instituting once more an authoritarian rule. I'm not just pulling things out of my ass here, there is historical precedent for this. I'll once again mention Rome. It began as a monarchy lasting for about 250 years before becoming tyrannical and being overthrown by the people in favor of a democracy. However, this democracy wasn't really all that democratic, and over the course of the next two centuries, by way of what were basically strikes, the plebeian underclass gained political rights and representation. Eventually, though, the democracy became corrupted and gave way to mob rule and chaos ultimately resulting once more in a monarchy. The Roman historian Polybius, born in 200 BC, aptly described this phenomenon that he called anacyclosis, or the cycle of political revolution. Anacyclosis describes an intricate cycle of six forms of governance. Monarchy, tyranny, aristocracy, oligarchy, democracy, and finally ochlocracy, or mob rule, and then repeat. I could make a whole separate video on this topic, and I might, but for now I'll focus on those last two as they're the ones relevant to the topic at hand. Polybius wrote that, As long as some of those survive who experience the evils of oligarchical dominion, they are well pleased with the present form of government and set a high value on equality and freedom of speech. But when a new generation arises and the democracy falls into the hands of the grandchildren of its founders, they have become so accustomed to freedom and equality that they no longer value them and begin to aim at preeminence, and it is chiefly those of ample fortune who fall into this error. So when they begin to lust for power and cannot attain it through themselves or their own good qualities, they ruin their estates, tempting and corrupting the people in every possible way. And hence, when, by their foolish thirst for reputation, they have created among the masses an appetite for gifts and the habit of receiving them, democracy in its turn is abolished and changes into a rule of force and violence. For the people, having grown accustomed to feed at the expense of others and to depend for their livelihood on the property of others, as soon as they find a leader who is enterprising but is excluded from the houses of office by his penury, institute the rule of violence. And now, uniting their forces, massacre, banish, and plunder until they degenerate again into perfect savages, and find once more a master and monarch. Many throughout the ages have described this cycle, from Machiavelli in his discourses on Livy to John Adams in his defense of the constitutions of the United States of America. America is at a precipice. We have allowed our institutions to decay, our government to become corrupted, and thus the whole system to become unbalanced. What we have now can hardly even be called a democracy at this point. Two parties that squabble about social policy while the national debt continues to skyrocket, with a welfare system that doesn't lift the poor out of poverty, but rather is designed in such a way as to keep them poor and dependent on government aid. If major changes are not made, we will find ourselves once more under master and monarch, almost certainly within my lifetime. The problem is, where do you begin? There is not a single part of our government and our institutions that are not in some way broken or corrupted. I don't know if it's possible at this point to prevent total collapse. When you have a president who sends in riot police to break up peaceful protests to get a photo op, and an opposition candidate who is clearly not in control of his mental faculties, but is being propped up by a desperate party establishment, is that even democracy, or is it just the choice between two brands of insanity? Is it really surprising, given the circumstances, that people are rioting in the streets? To me, it's not. This is something that we've been building up to for a very long time. I hate to keep coming back to this conclusion in seemingly every video, but this is honestly the path that I see us on. I believe the solution, overall, is to overturn the two-party system by voting for third parties in presidential and especially in local elections. John F. Kennedy once said that those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. It's an oft-quoted line, because with every day that passes, it becomes more and more relevant. Let's hope that we can heed his warning. Happy Independence Day, everyone.
Thank you for watching. This video took a great deal of research, much of which was derived from Polybius' primary work, The Histories. I may very well do a video exclusively about Anastoclosis at some point, as it's a topic which has interested me for a long time, and I think it has a great deal of significance nowadays. You'll also find various other sources listed in the description, along with a link to my Discord server, where many a shenanigan is had. Do the YouTube stuff, share the video around, leave a comment, and if you're one of the 60% of viewers who isn't subscribed, then subscribe. Having said all that, till next time.